It's time to get started So take a seat It's the Science Cafe Brought to you by OE I am a neuroscience and behavior student So I was really interested in this topic So a little bit for selfish reasons I proposed this uh, panel and I would like to have all my answer, my questions answered <laughs> from uh, this panel of amazing scientists. Um, so I want to ask them to introduce themselves and um, give a little bit of information about themselves. So if you don't mind saying who you are, how you got here, and just a little bit about your work. We're going to have a a little bit more chance to talk about your work in the end, but, um, and maybe a fun fact about yourself. This work? Okay, yeah, cool. Alright, um, my name is Maggie Ugolini, and I am a fifth year neuroscience and behavior student at UMass. Um, I'm almost done, I just scheduled my defense today, you're all invited. <laughs> it's March 29th. Um, no, please don't come, but you're invited to the tenure afterwards. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> So, I study language processing in children. Um, I use EEG to study that, and for my dissertation, I'm really interested in what happens if we make an experiment more relevant to the real world? Do we get different results? And how can we understand language processing using brain measures versus behavioral measures? Does that give different answers, better answers, stuff like that? Okay. Uh, I'm Adrian Stout. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Um, I am what is called a psycholinguist, so I, I study language processing. Um, most of my work, louder, louder. okay. Um, I'm a psycholinguist. I study language processing. Most of my work involves understanding how um, we recognize words in reading and how we assign grammatical structure to sentences as we read. Um, I have one foot in the UMass Linguistics Department, which um, is a very uh, famous and important linguistics department, actually. It usually ranked second or third in the world. We, we don't have any linguists here because they're all at a department event uh, tonight. But, um, and if they were here, I would put one of them here in my place. But, um, but uh, so I got, I'm on this panel because I got to know Maggie. She's helping me. Uh, implement an experiment in which we're tracking readers' eye movements at the same time as we record their EEG um, to compare uh, what the brain is doing and what the eyes are doing as people are recognizing words in reading. Um, and she dragged me, well, she nominated me for this panel, and so here we are. I've never been to one of these before. The fun fact, okay. Um, uh, after this, I'm going to the uh, World War II Club in Northampton for Thursday night trivia. Um, so I, I've had a couple of beers here, and, and I had a couple of beers there, and my my faculties will continue to decline, maybe linearly over the course of that. Uh, hi everyone, my name's Dan Bahaba. I'm a lecturer and postdoc researcher over at Smith College, just down the road. And I recently finished up my PhD in the opposite direction on Route 9 over at UMass, where I was studying the role of hormones in regulating how birds hear and learn bird song during development. And uh, my fun fact while researching uh, for this panel and learning about Coco the gorilla, which we'll talk about later, turns out me and Coco both have the same type of orange Manx cap, a bobtail cap, so I have something in common with a pretty advanced gorilla, it turns out. <laughs> Maggie, would you like to share a fun fact with us? Yeah, I didn't give you a fun fact. Um, hmm, okay. Yeah, okay, my, I can't say my fun fact is graduating soon, but I will give you another fun fact. I have a French bulldog, her name is Charlotte. Um, she recently completed a genetic study to see um, to something that was um, done by a postdoctoral researcher who used to um, be at UMass for their PhD. And they're interested in uh, genetic correlates of behavior with dogs. 
and I found out that my dog is such a purebred dog that her parents are only 22% different in genetic material. So that's a really pure dog. She's one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. I think we have, we're in pretty good company to answer some of these, some of your questions and our questions about language. We have someone that studies language in children, someone who studies reading and writing, but I think it's a very important component of language, if I'm not mistaken. And someone who studies communication, maybe language, I don't know what it is, I don't know. I guess we can talk about it a little bit. So, um, our uh, little poll is working really well here. We got some really cool answers. So I think, I think we're gonna start by reading a couple of these answers and answering probably the easiest question tonight, which is, what is language? By those faces, uh, was I wrong? Is that not an easy question? That's the hardest one. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wanna read some of, these, some of these answers first, okay? So what is language to you in a few words? Words. Conveying an emotion, sending a message, means of communicating wide range of thoughts, feelings, communication, so communication, a lot of it. Mental and behavioral way to apprehend experience. Wow, that's deep. All right, so what do you guys think of these answers? Um, and how do we think about, the, are we thinking about this, this question correctly? What is Language is it related to communicating feelings, emotions? Is, are we on the right path? Not really right to start. So I think that's an interesting approach to defining language that moves away from the really procedural definitions that people try to make in science to say that it is conveying a message that is specifically emotional or otherwise more meaningful than just maybe a signal that something is immediately happening. So maybe more abstract concepts. I think that's a really interesting approach. Um, I will say that I'm not a huge fan of super specific definitions of things like language because I think that we get into arguments about it that are unnecessary. Yeah, we do. But I think that all of your suggestions are really great. Would anyone like to add something to this definition? What is language? As someone who doesn't study human language, I would argue, and we'll talk more about it hopefully tonight, that language is really any learned vocal communication in an animal, human or otherwise. And uh, that's as broad as I would like to define it. Because like Maggie, I think you can get really deep into the specifics and setting really um, stringent goalposts that make it easier and easier to distinguish humans from other animals. However, I think animals do possess language. Oh. Okay, so the grounds of debate are set. I think language uh, is not necessarily vocal, and it is, and that animal communication is not language. So we'll, 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 we'll talk about this. <laughs> okay, that got a little, a little heated, <laughs> but it was a good start. I think. All right, um, I think in that aspect, I'll, I'd like to give Dan a little bit of a chance to answer to that. Um, so, does language really makes us special? Are humans special snowflakes because we have language and... Um, no. Okay. <laughs> humans are special for other reasons, but there exists, I would say, along a spectrum of vocal communicators or learned vocal communicators. So certainly I'm able to sit here tonight and talk to you all about language as sort of meta-analysis, whereas maybe other species that learn vocal communication wouldn't be able to engage in a sort of metacognition. However, um, it doesn't discount their abilities as well. So uh, maybe I should show some of the slides for this. So one thing, I, I tend to think about language in parallel in humans with animal vocal communication, or non-human animal vo uh, vocal communication. And uh, you all probably have some vocal communicating animal at home. You probably have a cat or a dog that keeps you up at night or begs for food. However, well, there's a lot of animals that communicate using vocal cues, like barking, meowing, so on and so forth. Maybe the next slide I could show. Uh, there's actually a really small subset of animals that actually require learning early in life in order to produce these vocalizations. 
So even though your cat meows, it's sort of pre-programmed with that ability. If it never heard another cat meow, it would still continue to meow. However, if you look at the crossing animal kingdom, vocal learning is exceedingly rare. That's why we really champion humans as being really special, right? We learn our language. However, we're not that special because there are other animals out there that do this as well. Uh, one of the most prominent examples is an uh, animal you'll start hearing soon as the spring approaches, which is songbirds. They learn their song either seasonally, so every year in the spring, or early in development. Um, hummingbirds are another example, and parrots as well is probably another obvious one. They're vocal mimics as well. But there's, all the, there's also other mammals that learn vocal communication as well, that you might not think of as well, such as whales and dolphins, as well as seals, and um, walruses, and even bats have a learned vocal communication as well. So we're part of an exclusive club, but we're not the only ones in it. So it sounds like the answer is it's complicated, and depends on who you ask, and depends on how you define languages. Am I right to assume that? Is that, is that fair? Okay, so I guess it's complicated. Thanks. <laughs> Would you like to add something? Would you like to add? Or, uh, so, uh, yeah. so, I, mean, uh, I think we'll have more opportunity to talk about animal versus human communication. So, okay. Yeah. But I actually have a, a question for you. Um, so it, it looks like humans, of course, we're really famous for knowing language and a lot of ethnicities and all over the world we develop language somehow. And I have an impression that writing and reading also seem to be universal to language. Is that a fair assumption? A writing language essential? Uh, I'd say no. Um, so, in fact, for the, um, the um, for most of the of, of human history, of the approximately 100,000 years, we think, during which humans have had have, uh, communicated by means of, of spoken language, we did not have writing systems. So writing systems are a very cultural, are a cultural invention that, that is very new. Um, language is also sort of new in, in, in evolutionary terms, but is evolutionarily much older than writing. Writing is so new as to be really considered, I mean, really is just a recent social invention. And in fact, still, you know, much of the world, uh, m m much of the, many, many, many people who have um, perfectly well-developed abilities to speak and comprehend language do not read or write. So it's not, um, it's, it makes use of our capacity for spoken language. Writing makes, write, reading and writing make use of our capacity for both spoken language uh, and for comprehending language, but are not um, in any way entailed by that capacity. Cool. That's, so I was wrong. <laughs> awesome. So I guess we can move on from this uh, debate a little bit. I, I don't want to get physical here. So, um, Let's make it a little light, lighter at least. Um, how do we actually learn it? Okay, so so Dan has, has said emphatically that animals do learn how to communicate, and uh, but it, but it's not a disputed fact that we go through this process. Everyone has. So let's talk about the mechanisms a little bit. Not mechanism, but maybe in practice, how do we learn? Language? Yeah, so your first language is a really interesting thing because you can acquire your first language without explicit instruction. So you just need exposure. Um, you do need specific kinds of exposure, but it's different from learning a second language like Spanish or you know, you go to school, someone teaches you very explicitly how to speak that language. Your first language is very different. Um, and what's interesting about this is there are sort of kind of implicit ways that parents will help their children acquire their first language. So one of these ideas is motherese. So it's the kind of sing-songy voice that you use with a baby. And you probably do this naturally to babies, but I do it to pets too, I think that's common. Um, you just find yourself doing this to babies or young children and you don't really think too much about it, but this is actually helpful for them. Um, you're exaggerating certain things in the speech signal that really helps the child acquire language. Um, children are also more likely to pay attention to you if you do this type of speaking. And as long as you're not overly simplifying what you're saying, this kind of thing is great. Um, it does vary culturally, but especially for native English speakers, this is something that happens, and it's something that helps babies learn their first language 
in a way that requires no explicit, specific instruction. So, so it's great that you mentioned uh, first versus second languages because I'm very interested in this because I'm not, English is not my first language. But the first thing that people notice when I start with my second and third or fourth beer is that my accent might come out. No, no joke. <laughs> my accent starts coming out. Uh, so, but, but a lot of people have accents that are stronger than mine. So I've heard even when I drink. So how does that work? So I started learning English really young. So does that play a role? Is that? Yes, definitely. So there is debate about whether the, you guys have probably heard about the idea that if you're really young, that's a great time to learn a second language. And as you get older, you get worse at learning a second language. There's debate about why this is, and what, is it the brain, is it social, is it even real? But there is some evidence that learning a second language without an accent is way easier if you do it younger. And this comes down to something called phonological categories. So a phonological category is kind of the, the category of sounds that you think is one letter. So for example, in Japanese, the letters R and L are within the same phonological category, which means they're not two different letters. So if someone is a native Japanese speaker and then they come and learn English, it's very difficult for them to distinguish these two letters because their entire life, that's all been one thing. It's like asking you to discriminate between slightly darker blue and slightly lighter blue as two different things, but it's even harder because the speech signals happen so fast, they go away, it's so rapid. Um, so changing the boundaries of your phonological categories is something that happens in infancy and early childhood, and it can be difficult to push those boundaries around, and that's why accents can persist, even if you have exposure to your second language for years and years and years. And some people have this ability to completely get rid of that, and they don't have an accent anymore, but not everybody. So, um, Dan, can we learn anything about animals from humans? Does, do the mechanisms or the ways that animals learn their communication, do they relate to the way humans learn at all? Is, that, is, it, is it similar? Yes. <laughs> right? That's yeah. <laughs> That's it. No, so uh, one thing that uh, Maggie was uh, sort of approaching is this idea of learning language earlier in life being easier. And this is this concept called critical period plasticity. Maybe people have heard about this, about why learning language early in life is a lot easier. And we know this is true in age-limited vocal learners. Um, the best examples that we know about this and the most well-studied vocal learners, the ones that I studied, are songbirds in particular. So um, zebra finches, which is a type of bird that I studied in my uh, grad research, they first have to listen before they ever produce their own speech. So much like human infants don't really make many sounds, maybe they cry, but that's about it. They don't really begin to babble right away. Birds are the same exact way. They listen before they speak. And we call that the, uh, the social phase or sensory phase, where they're just sort of taking all that information in and creating what's called an auditory memory or you know a memory of dad's song or mom's song depending on the type of bird which is thought to be pretty similar to humans as I understand it. Um, similar to humans as well after this auditory memory is formed they go through what's called sensory motor learning and what that entails is now that they have this auditory memory they start to produce their song and it sounds like crap. It sounds like a for those who are old enough to remember what rewinding a cassette tape sounds like, that's essentially what birds sound like when they first begin producing their song. It's this warbled noise. It sounds just as bad forward as in reverse. But what they do is they start to compare that noise to that auditory memory they've compared. And then they're like, oh, wow, what I produced was absolute junk. I should change it a little bit. And so then they refine that song little by little, and that's what's called air correction learning. So they realize how different what the noise they're producing is from the memory that they've created of their parent song, and then eventually they create a pretty good copy or an iteration of their parent song. And that is you know, a loose analogy to how we think humans learn language as well. Adrian's gonna... <laughs> okay, so um, let me start by returning to my earlier remark, which I disputed 
your characterization of language. So, from, so human language researchers often point out that each of the sentences that one hears, or most, most of the sentences that one hears are sentences that one has never heard before. So, um, uh, you know, in your response just now, you, you uttered an, uh, a, 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 a large number of sentences which presumably, many of them, most, most of the people in this audience had never heard before. Um, and you had probably never uttered them before. So you have very limited, you have certain linguistic elements at your disposal, right? You have speech sounds, and then you have words. And you can combine them in completely novel ways according to a certain set of rules. And the rules are the grammatical rules of your language. And then the combination of those words according to the grammatical rules of your language gives rise to certain very specific meanings which you have in mind as a speaker and which your audience is then able to recover as a listener. So each instance of you using your language is essentially, a no you are communicating a novel message, right? You're doing something, you're, you're combining a, a set, a, a repertoire of linguistic elements in an entirely novel way, right? So the difference that human language researchers see between human language and animal communication is in this creativity. And that is, what we are doing as humans is on the fly uh, using a set of linguistic elements in this entirely novel way on each instance to, to produce messages that have never been produced before. Right? Um, communication can consist of something as simple of, as, you know, um, smoke signals or semaphore or, um, or for that matter, waving. Right? So these are, these are stereotyped behaviors which correspond to very specific meanings. Um, and so human language researchers see that, that this enormous gulf between what any language communicate, what any animal communication system is actually doing and what human language is doing on the other hand. So, that, so that's why I just wanted to explain why it is that human language researchers see language as something really different in kind, not just in degree, but really different in kind from animal communication. Um, as for learning, uh, Human language researchers, so people who study language acquisition, actually don't see human language development as in any way an instance of copying. Okay, so human language researchers think that in fact the human infant is abstracting a, a very complex set of rules and representations from the input. But that is, let me say that in a less, in a less, from a lot, uh, the less lingo. The human infant is actually learning a lot of very abstract things about their language, which they are then using to generate novel utterances, which again, nobody has ever heard before, right? So they're not actually copying individual utterances that their parents have produced. Their parents have probably never produced most of the utterances that they're, produced, that they're producing. They're learning a set of rules which govern how they're gonna turn a message into, into new utterances which is a really different thing from copying what your parents have done. So it looks like we need to go back to our definition of language at, for the night one more time to update it. Is it fair then to say that language is not one thing? It's made up of several different um, processes, like vocal learning, like auditory learning, like innovation, creativity for, to make new phrases. And perhaps, since we like to, we like evolution a, a lot here, perhaps animals are halfway there. They mastered vocal learning, they mastered auditory learning, but they haven't developed the sophistication of our language. Is that fair? So that's a really, I mean, so the question of how to relate in evolutionary terms, human language to animal language, is a really difficult question that I think nobody has a satisfactory answer to. Um, I'm certainly, I don't have, I, I don't have it. I mean, so, 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 how many people here have heard of Noam Chomsky? Okay, I almost said that. So, so Chomsky is the father of modern linguistics, and he, he, he has, has a, a theory of, I mean, he, one, one, one shouldn't even call it a theory. He regards human language as so, as so completely distinct from any animal communication system that he thinks that the only way that human language could possibly have evolved is that there was essentially a sudden mutation which sent human language off in this completely different direction, right? 
Um, now, I cannot evaluate that. I have no idea whether that hypothesis is correct or not, but that's one of the live hypotheses on the table because it's really hard to see how a more continuous trajectory would work, right? How we get from anything that looks like animal communication systems to what we have as, as human language. I imagine it's not, it wasn't easy for him to put this out there without many debates, huh? Oh, I mean, they're, yeah, <laughs> very serious people. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. All right, I think we are uh, ready for some questions for the audience, from the audience. So we have a first hand here. So before we answer that, did everyone hear the, the question? Is that good? Oh, okay, great. Okay, yeah, so that is an awesome idea. Um, there is no drawbacks to that. There's some, there was some concern that maybe a child that is exposed to two languages at once might speak later, might have a hard time, might be confused. Um, sometimes that happens, but it's not a big deal. The, the main thing that you're getting is the benefit of having two languages. So there, it, there is work that shows that children who are bilingual are better at something called executive function. So you can kind of define that as like their ability to switch um, their attention to something new, stay on task, kind of higher level cognitive abilities. Um, there's a lot of, there's some brain imaging research and there's also correlational research that suggests that being a bilingual child is great for you in that regard. So I think that's an awesome idea and I have no advice other than do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here up in the front, yep. Yeah. If the mother is speaking, whether the child responds differently to the mother or father, as far as learning as to how you respond, the number of interactions with the father versus the mother, the type of nurturing, okay. I would think that could be quite All right, so the, the question is if it, if the, which of the parents speaks which language, if it matters? Because you imagine that maybe the mom has more interaction maybe with the, the child, is that your question? Yeah, and even how the child would interpret I see. the different languages, because they would both speak differently. Huh. That's very interesting. I think that also interacts with whether the mother's language is the language of everybody else around the child. So for example, if the mother is speaking Spanish and the child is here in an area that speaks English, um, how that would be different. I actually, I don't have any like experimental evidence for you for how that would work, but I, I imagine that the amount of input that the child is receiving really matters. So if the child has a mother who speaks English and they're with that mother a lot, their community speaks English, they are going to be dominant in English as opposed to maybe the father speaks Spanish and they only in, encounter the father speaking Spanish. Um, yeah, so that would definitely be a factor, but they're still gonna get the benefits of being a bilingual child. Yeah, I, I Oh, interesting. Right, so you maybe your primary caregiver, you're more bonded to them, and then you are more likely to speak their language. I think that that's also entirely possible. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, I'm not a linguist, but one of the things that I hear linguists say is that there really aren't such things as separate human languages, that they intergrade um, at the boundaries, and that really you have one phenomenon of human language, and you can identify people that are all monolingual, but that there really aren't such things as separate languages. That there are intergradations among, among them all, such that it's all one continuous human phenomenon. Yeah, do you have any comment on that? That seems like an interesting. One. Okay, yeah, so so um, one of the things that that we learn from from contemporary linguistics is the the commonalities among human languages are rather striking. And in fact, one might argue that human languages are much more similar than they are different. And in fact, that this is related to the learning issue, right? So, so it has been argued that one of the ways that kids, one of the things that makes it possible for kid, a kid to learn language, to learn their, the language that they're hearing around them, is that they have, a, they have knowledge 
even innate knowledge about what the possibilities are, and the possibilities are actually really tightly constrained, right? Like, so th there are only so many things, there are only, there are only so many possible languages that they could be hearing, because human language can only vary in certain con tightly constrained ways, and then they just have to figure out which one of these sort of very sort of close variations they're actually hearing, right? Um, now, of course, human languages, one way that human languages are often distinguished is just the possibility of communication between two people. Right? So, I mean, if, if I'm a, a monolingual speaker of English and you're a monolingual speaker of Mandarin, right, we won't be able to communicate linguistically. Whereas if I'm a monolingual speaker of, you know, standard American English and you're a monolingual speaker of, um, you know, a dialect from New Orleans, right, we will be able to communicate. So that, that's how we distinguish sort of the notion of dialect from the notion of language is simply the possibility of, in, of communication between between two individuals. But there's no sort of deep difference there, right? It's just, do we manage to communicate, right? So yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're right that, that, that there are uh, enormous similarities. The generalizations that hold at all levels, at the level of sound, at the level of how words are formed, at the level of how sentences are formed, there are generalizations that hold across all human languages that are really profound, yeah. Cool. Uh, can, we are just going to get one more question from you in glasses, and then we can move on to the next session, and then we're going to have a Q&A, a longer one. Yeah. I was just wondering if you're overemphasizing novelty in language. I know, certainly growing up, I heard a lot of repetition, um, specifically from my mother, as in, pick up your room, pick up your room, pick up your room, pick up your room. Uh, with a lot of variation to, as in, please pick up your room, please, for the love of God, pick up your room. And, I know, I'm just thinking that in a lot of our conversations, there's a lot of the same thing. So the clerk, hi, how are you? Yes, thank you. Oh, it's raining out. Uh, but there is also that capability of putting together completely new sentences that we haven't said out loud. But a lot of our stuff is casual and repetitious and, and repetitious as well. Right. Okay, so uh, let's see how I want to respond to this. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, so there, so there are constructions, there are idioms that occur a lot, right? Um, absolutely. Um, but <coughs> memorizing those is not a good way to learn language, right? Um, and memor and and producing those is not a good way to interact, right? And that is so. Someone who who simply memorizes set expressions and is not able to use language productively. By product and what productively means for linguists is basically to create new, new forms. That, that person actually will not really be a speaker, right? So, right. so if, you, if you encounter someone who seems at first glance to be a speaker of English, but all they can do is produce set memorized expressions, you realize, aha, that person actually doesn't really speak English. They're very right. What's that? Like yeah, like Lacta like Gravis, right, right, right. On the other hand, someone who really is a speaker of English can do crazy things involving novel forms, right? So like you can read Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll, and you can recognize that even though the individual words are not even words, there is a sense in which these are well-formed sentences, right? And you can convey that meaning to somebody else. And, and yeah, yeah. So, so you're, you know something about your language that goes well beyond knowledge of the specific input that you've heard before. So um, we're just gonna call this Q&A for a little bit, but we, we're gonna have another one soon, and it's gonna be longer, I promise. Um, so I have, I have a burning question in my head right now, because we, we heard from the perspective of a linguist Noam Chomsky, how language might have evolved. But I'd like to hear from the perspective of maybe evolutionists. And do we have other ideas out there about how, how language might have evolved? Because we have these cool things that animals can also do, might, you know, might be related, might not be related, but there could be, I imagine, competing ideas, right? Dan. Yeah, so um, I'm afraid to use the word language now, sitting next to Adrian. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I would say that um, from what I know, so I know less about you know, human language evolution and I know more about how we think vocal learning evolution has come to exist in songbirds, for example, probably the most well-studied 
um, set of animals that are vocal learners. And one idea is that it's originally um, this part of your brain called motor cortex that um, is involved for sort of just that, doing motor behaviors. Um, some examples are these really complex gestural displays or essentially dancing in certain birds. So there's, there's these type of birds in the neotropics called mannequins that can uh, moonwalk just as good as Michael Jackson, I would argue. Um, and so some of the theories is that birds that have sort of um, branched out from these really highly motor expressing animals, the uh, certain areas of the brain have sort of sequestered this motor region for motor production of vocalizations instead. So instead of having this elaborate dance, now you have this elaborate courtship vocalization instead. So that's sort of one idea that's persistent in the field right now, this motor theory of learning as well. Uh, one idea too is that um, auditory learning has sort of been much more evolutionary conserved. So if you look at how the brain receives auditory information, how we all hear, it's pretty well conserved across humans, across mammals, birds, so on and so forth, the same basic pathway. But something special happened in birds and humans and bats to allow them to correspond this auditory learning to a learned vocal production as well. Cool. Does anyone have any to add? I'm just, this brings up for me something that I think is interesting, is the difference in variability of the productions. So I feel like with animal communication, the sounds that they're producing are very well reproduced, I guess. So, stereotyped. they're stereotyped, exactly, yeah, so, so really, yeah. okay, because, so what I was going to say is that I know that with the zebra finches, they have, <laughs> what? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they have, um really, really specific song structures, and like I will listen to things that Matt will play for me, and he'll be like, oh, that's different, and I'm like, no, it's not. I'm like, that's the same. Um, but one thing that I think that's interesting about humans is that we have a really broad, uh, like, low-level acoustic properties that can count under one category. So, for example, you can produce a given letter sound, like a P, very, very differently, but speakers will be like, oh, okay, that's a P, and I have a large continuum of P sounds that I will accept. Um, same thing goes for sentences. It gets even crazier with sentences. There's just massive amounts of acoustic variability, and there's this sort of abstract concept of that, it's not just the low-level signal, but it's this higher-level concept of that sound meaning something. So I'm interested to hear about other animals that have more variability, because I'm not familiar with that. I should preface all of this by saying that we're talking, or I guess I'm talking a lot about vocal communication in animals, and I'd just like to put an asterisk next to all that, that vocal communication is not the end-all, be-all in communication in the animal kingdom, and in fact, we focus very heavily on learned vocal communication, but there's animals that communicate with odors, like oh, um, you know, dogs and rodents, they have a lot of odor cues in which they communicate with each other, there's types of fish that will actually communicate with electricity so they can measure sort of um, current being produced. Um, there's, you know, animals that, you know, communicate with dance as well. So we're, we're talking about a pretty limited sphere right here because it's the best analogy that we have to spoken language in humans. Um, so I'd just like to preface with all of that. But getting to your point about sort of uh, more dynamic, maybe, song. So we study in the lab, um, very commonly, this cute little bird called the zebra finch. And maybe if any of you have been to Petco or have one at home, you, you've seen these tiny little cute songbirds that have the zebra, uh, zebra like stripes on their chest. And we study them because they are simple in the lab. So I think what Maggie was getting at, that they have this really awful song. In fact, I have a clip of it, but we shouldn't expose anyone to it. It sounds like a squeaky sure. dog toy. Well, are you plugged into sound? Yeah. So this is what... Not awful. So no, so no one would argue that's melodic, right? No one would enjoy listening to that. But what it is, and Adrian was also getting together, is that it's highly stereotyped. And so that's what makes it a convenient model to study in the lab, is that you know they have about four or five notes in their syllable. It's the only song they'll typically sing. 
But it turns out even zebra finches are more complex than just their four or five syllables that they produce. They have individual contact calls that they learn, so, so for individual recognition. But um, other popular animals to study that are songbirds include uh, animals that you see all around here, which are European starlings. So people that are maybe backyard birders, you probably see them. They're an introduced species, so purists really hate them because they're kind of an introduced pest, more or less. Uh, but they have repertoires of you know 300 plus songs in their vocabulary. So to argue that all songbirds have sort of this fixed one song is overly simplistic. There's this huge dynamic range and spectrum of complexity, at least in songbirds. And I would argue that's why I think vocal communication or learned vocal communication is on a spectrum. You have these really advanced animals such as songbirds that have this really dynamic way of communicating. And then you probably have, you know, the top dogs, which are humans, you know, we're the best at learned vocal communication, but we're not exclusive in this club. So you have something to add or okay. Uh. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. That was really interesting. Um, so, we've learned what language isn't. What, I, what language is, we're kind of a little iffy. It depends on who you ask. It's complicated, several definitions. Language is not only one thing, all that. So, it seems like scientists haven't really decided yet on that aspect. On that aspect. Um, but, when you look at the animal world, and, and, Dan, and Dan gave a lot of examples of animals that learn things in their own uh, biology, right? So songbirds learn how to sing, and then we have bats and stuff. But there, we, we've been trying as humans to teach animals our language, right? Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Coco the gorilla, learns a bunch of signs. I, we have a video about Coco here. Um, oh, we used to, I don't know where it went. Maybe we don't. What happened to my video? No, we don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, here it is. Where did it go? Why did it go there? So, here's Coco. Unfortunately, Coco died uh, last year. But this is uh, called Coco's last message to humanity. Um, she says, man, Coco love. Earth, Coco love. But man, stupid. <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Coco sorry. Coco cry. Time hurry. Fix earth. Help earth. Hurry. Protect earth. Nature. See you. Thank you. So, people have taught through their entire time. Scientists spent light their entire lives trying to teach Coco signs and, and things like that. Um, there's also another example of, of uh, chimpanzees. So, on June 11, like 1975, Lana. the historic incident occurred. After I placed the cabbage in the machine, Lana questioned me in the following manner. Question, you put chow in machine? To which I responded, chow in machine. This exchange took place four additional times, after which Lana came back with, question, chow in machine? To which I responded, yes. Lana was not about to buy this, however, when she came back with no chow in machine, which was indeed true. I asked, question, what in machine? She did not respond, so I repeated it again, question, what in machine? To which Lana responded, cabbage in machine. So, we can start with Adrian. Um, does that count? If we teach animals our language, does it count? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I don't want to. Be, <laughs> I feel like I, I, there's no way to respond to this without being a serious party pooper. Um, I, I'm very skeptical about what these 
isolated demonstrations actually show. So, um, so, okay, let's take this at face value. The, how long an answer am I allowed to give here? 30 seconds, okay, or a minute, I, okay, I'll be quick. So, so what this, what, what, the, let's just take the second, second case. So, question, chow in machine, cabbage in machine, it's on. Right, so these are um, impressive feats on the part of a chimpanzee to string together signs in this way. No question that that's true. And it, it is impressive that the, it, it is the case that apes, <coughs> chimpanzees, gorillas have been taught to associate signs with objects. And it is also the case that they have been taught to associate um, and they've been taught to put together these signs in order, in a way that is interpretable to their human experimenters. That is all true. Um, are they doing anything that is akin to human language? So how would a human ask the question whether uh, something is in the machine? So first of all, they would do this funny thing um, in which they, uh, they invert the order of an auxiliary verb, right? So they would say, is the chow in the machine, right? So that's what we call a movement operation. Um, the, now, I'm not saying that a movement operation is required for human language, but it is characteristic of human language. So every language has these complicated movement operations in which, in which the message is um, that the nature of the message is determined by the, the, the fine details of the order in which the elements are occurring. Instead, this chimpanzee has learned that when he wants to communicate a message, a question, start out with this thing, this, this token that says question, right? I mean, that's very impressive. That's great that the chimpanzee knows that. Chimpanzees are very smart. We share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees. They're very smart. It, that is very impressive, and it is telling us something about the symbolic abilities of the chimpanzee. It is not telling us that they have anything like human language, I think. Cool. No, no, you would like to add something. Uh, yes, so I definitely agree with Adrian about that. Um, I think it is, it's an interesting sort of workaround that we have this, so what this chimp is doing, her name is Lana, what she's doing is, She's pressing buttons on this computer that are lexigrams. So that is like a little picture. It doesn't specifically represent what it is. So for example, the lexigram for apple is not gonna be a picture of an apple. It's like a random symbol. She's pressing that to represent a word. And they've given her a button that represents the concept of a question. So she just has to press this question button and she knows that she can get things when she presses this question button and then follows it with a string of words or button presses. Um, and like what Adrian is saying, that's very different from using syntactic or grammatical structure to get your point across. It's a much simpler operation. Um, there was a lot of excitement about this in the beginning. Um, later experiments showed that they do have a difficult time even without a question, with like more complicated grammar. So for example, if you ask them to do two things in one sentence, they will do only the first thing they can't remember to do the second thing. Um, if you mess with the order of words, um, so instead of something like, the boy chases the dog, you could say, the dog was chased by the boy, they would never understand the difference between those two sentences, how we use syntax to make those different. Um, I think Lana is a better example because we have this, this button pressing behavior that gives us a very concrete record of what she's doing. I think Coco was a little bit more difficult to interpret. I don't know if you guys noticed that was kind of a supercut of a lot of signs, and we can't really tell what order they were put in, which is unfortunate. I don't want to say they messed with the order, but we don't know. Um, and it's also interesting, where is she getting these ideas, right? Like these are very profound ideas from this gorilla, like telling you, save the earth, that she's watching you, time is running out. Like it's, it's very dramatic and it's very, it, it would be moving if you could take it at face value, but that's something that's kind of difficult to do. Um, so I, I definitely agree with Adrian that these are really fascinating test cases 
and interesting to push the limits of animal cognition and see if they're given a language system, what can they do with it, but it's not human. Can I add one, can I add one remark to that? So, so Maggie was pointing out that you know, this may be a supercut, and there's a very famous example from, I'm not sure if it's from Coco or from another earlier ape who was taught some human sign, some signs, but one very exciting development was the use of the phrase water bird to refer to a duck. And this is great, right? I mean, so this is a novel combination of concepts to refer to a particular entity, and it makes sense. But it turns out that, in fact, what the, I can't even remember, I can't remember if it was Coco, so I don't know if it was a gorilla or a chimp. It was a chimp, it was Nim? Washo. Okay, so it was Washo, it was wa okay, thank you. So, um, so what Washo, I'm gonna take your word for it, what Washo said, in fact, was water, 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 bird, bird, bird. Okay, and the middle two expressions from that were extracted, and in fact, that, I mean, makes sense, right? Water, bird, duck. But in fact, that the full string was water, 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 bird, bird, bird. So, I mean, there's always been a lot of excitement about the possibility of teaching apes some sort of linguistic communication, and it has led to over-exuberance on the part of researchers and over-interpretation of certain um, very ambiguous utterances or uses of signs. Dan, would you like to add something to this? Or? Great, great, great. All right, this is fascinating. Do you do we have any questions? All right. Have, have you, Dan? You're, you're with zebra finches. Yep. But have you done any work, or has any of you, look at, especially since you talked about Coco and and everybody else, the the chimps and the big guy there? Um, have you done any studies or looked at any of the research that Irene Pepperberger has done with Alex? The parrot. The parrot? Yeah. So I, I'm not as familiar with Alex the parrot. I mean, I know of all of the training. Maybe someone else actually knows more about the parrot. I love Alex. Because yeah. what, <laughs> I, what, I, what I found was that when parrots are learning to speak, they make the same vocal sounds as young children, mm, okay. as they speak. They come up they're exactly the same. It's almost like babbling it's, in your experience? Yeah, they babble. Oh, that's cool, okay. But, you know, the parrots, when they're young, and babies, when they're young, they babble. No matter what language they're learning, whether no matter around the world, they make this babbling sound. Mm -hmm. Parrots do the same thing. So, Dan, do you know about bird babbling? Do your birds babble? Yeah, they totally babble. But when they're learning their own language, not when they're learning to mimic human speech. And right. I don't know if that's what you're referring to. But Alex didn't mimic. Mm -hmm. Alex. Yeah, and, and that was one of the th findings. I mean, her thing was on aut autistic children, if I remember remembering correctly. She was looking for communication and how to communicate with autistic children. That's and why she picked Alex. I don't know, but. Alex was able to verbalize and communicate um, in English. Right, yeah, I know that Alex, he learned labels for things, right? So she could ask him, like, get four green blocks, and he would go do it. And if he wanted a walnut as opposed to an almond, right. he would be very specific and, mm -hmm. and tell her that. Yeah, that he, he wants wanted. a walnut. Yeah. Right, exactly. So that sounds like a learned vocabulary. Yeah which is similar to what these animals have, right? They have a very specific vocabulary. And there is some interesting debate about Alex. So in general, people say an animal has never asked a question. But Alex, as it's been recorded that Alex asked an existential question. So people say, Alex asked, what color am I? Whoa. Which is cool. And like, that would be a big deal. And I really wish we could verify it because that would be very interesting. I think everything about Alex is really fascinating because you're right, it's not just mimicking. He learned the vocabulary and he used it and his abilities were remarkable and they're on video. Like you can't question that he did yeah. really, really amazing things. Well, she worked with other birds as well so, and I don't know where her research has gone since then, so. I really don't either, yeah. All right, yeah, I'm ready. I'm gonna give another shot at the novel animal language. Um, and I can't remember who did the study, 
But they took a pool and they partitioned it, and there was one dolphin on one side and a dolphin on the other side. And um, on one side, the trainers would be like, okay, hit the button on the left. And the dolphin would have to say to his buddy on the other side, hit the thing on the left, and that they both got fish afterwards. And they could do that consistently, which seems novel because in the ocean they don't tell each other hit the button on the left. Mm. I, I don't know. That's, uh, that's an interesting example. I mean, that is an interesting. Yeah. So, so those are the those are like the edge cases, right? That's the tough. Those are the tough cases. Yeah, I agree. I would, I would just add, and it's sort of related to that, is that a lot of animals can do auditory learning tests. Dolphins totally learn their own vocal communication, and I think we're just only recently starting to appreciate that it goes beyond just you know these noises that they make for individual recognition, but just as easily as you can teach a dog, you know, that the to say sit, you know, relates into a certain behavioral response. Perhaps you can also translate. Uh, maybe I've upset Andrea, so I'm looking for the microphone. That's uh, you grab the microphone. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I was just saying that uh, you, you can teach behavioral associations with learned auditory information. That gets back to this idea of this ancestral uh, auditory circuit that we all have, and being able to pair that with learning. Can we have one more? Uh, let's see. Oh, I have to pick. Okay, so you had it for the first one. Yeah, sorry. You want to say animals with really remarkable things if you look at squirrels getting into the bird cage and the bird feeders. It's hard to keep them out of the bird. They're very intelligent and that sort of that they can't do much else. They get run over all the time. So I think we can just both underestimate what the animals can do and overestimate what we generalize from them. And I'm just wondering with bird song. I'm sure they're very good at that. But what else can they do? And more generally, what is the relationship between music, song, and language? That last part, I really, that, that's a big question. What's the relationship between music and bird song? And the only thing I know is that back in, I think the 1800s, before there was radio recorded music, before phonographs came out, they used to train different types of birds, such as nightingales, with flute music. And then you would buy that nightingale and it would repeat back that flute music. And so before there was radios and pre-recorded music, you'd buy a songbird to just do that very task, to listen to song, because you didn't have music in the house. Recorders? There you go, so correction, recorder, not flute. Thank you for that, yeah. Clearly I know more about birds than instruments, so maybe not even that. Um, but I would get back to a uh, pretty loaded question uh, that John was asking, are we underestimating or overestimating uh, animals' intelligence by example of squirrels getting run over? And I would say that's you know a, a huge exaggeration because just because modern inventions that are only as recent as you know the last 50, 80 years. When was the first car invented? 1920s, something like that? T model? 1980s. 1880s. Okay, so I'm way 140 years. The the scale of evolutionary time is a lot slower than the scale of human invention time. So one good example as a counter to that um, is the nine-banded armadillo that isn't quite common around these parts of the woods, but if you go down to Florida, it's essentially the most common roadkill that you'll find down there. It's essentially the squirrels of the south. And the reason that they're very common roadkill is because of their adaptation to react to an oncoming, uh, oncoming predator is to jump up rather than jump out of the way. So if they're in the middle of the street and a car is coming, instead of to run quickly, they run up and then they just end up getting hit by a car. So I'd say by judging an animal's intelligence by the basis of modern technology is a bit of an unfair comparison in that way. So if anything, we're underestimating their ability to adapt to, you know, uh, their own uh, environment compared to our more rapidly changing landscape. Yeah. I would add to that that even, even human language has only a very tenuous relationship to intelligence. Um, the, the notion of, so, so 
every neurologically intact human learns a language essentially without any difficulty whatsoever, right? So I mean, even um, uh, and and the um, there doesn't seem to be any kind of so, so there's differences in vocabulary depending on one's education level, but one's mastery of the basic rules of the sound the sound system of one's language and the uh, and the, the grammatical rules of one's language is essentially perfect, regardless of one's level of intelligence and one's performance in other domains. Um, on that ground, I mean, it's been argued that language is some is sort of a, should be thought of as something like a, um, a, a, a species ability that is is really not even learned in any kind of literal sense but rather develops in much the same way as an as ability like walking develops. Um, rather unconnected to general intellectual capacity. There are two reasons I was asking that question. One is we're talking about teaching the animals human language, which is a very, very different thing. They didn't evolve to learn human language. No more did we evolve to learn to you know, figure out where the food is or where it's buried. But the other part is on the music. I heard the other day that uh, playing music or teaching people about music helps their Alzheimer's. <laughs> and so there's got to be some kind of connection in there between music and linguistics. I'm not familiar with the connection that you mentioned between losing, is it you said learning an instrument or learning to play music and reduced well, rates of Alzheimer's? I think learning to, yeah. but there was something about music that facilitates your language. Yeah, yeah I, I can't speak to that. I don't know if anyone else can speak to that. Oh, well, that seems like a, we can go deep into the woods talking about yeah. that stuff. It's really interesting. We should move on, thank you. Um, just one last question, you had one, yeah? A general comment and a question for Dan. Um, it just, once we start talking about this and thinking about it, all these questions start coming up. For probably everyone, like music I was thinking of, like minor chords and major chords that are responsive, is that universal? The way our sentences go up when we ask a question, is that universal? How animals will whine, and people sort of have that same whine, is that, you know, inherent? Is but about the zebra finch, auditory memory, I don't get that because in the natural world, we learn, as children and birds, and I would think animals learn by, around them, their, their models. So did you um, isolate the zebra finch once it was exposed to the language it was supposed to copy, then put it in a cage by itself to see if it relied on auditory memory? Is that how you did it? Yeah, so that's a great question. So zebra finches in the wild, they're actually this very gregarious species. So they roll about 150 deep in the wild, and they're with a whole bunch of other different birds as well. They're native to the outback of Australia. And um, it turns out that you tend to learn best from the beak that feeds you. So kind of like you learn from, you were asking about you know, maternal care and you know, that stronger bond relationship, and maybe you learn more from it. At least we know from zebra finches, that um, even though they're hearing their uncles and other males in the trees and in the lab and like the different cages, that they'll only learn from the males that actually feed them. And interestingly as well, if you take away the dad, but you have a brother in there, they'll learn, it's called horizontal transmission, they'll actually learn from sort of the oldest brother in the nest as well. Um, and then you were asking as well, like how do you figure out um, yeah, so the way, how do you know that? That's a great question. So one thing that we've been talking about is the different phases of learning language. And um, I would argue for songbirds, it's similar to human language learning in that you listen before you speak. And so one thing, one trick, or one way that people have taken advantage of that aspect is you train a bird, you, you just play that song to it, either with a live animal or with a tape recorder, depending on the species. And you do that only when it's not producing its own song. So they don't actually start producing song until, at least for zebra finches, they're about 40 days old. So if you train it before it's 40, you know that the only auditory information it's getting is from whatever you present it with. 
And then if you raise it with a female, at least for zebra finches, females don't sing, you know that it's not receiving any other male song to impact its song development. And so at the end of the day, when it gets to adulthood, you can compare that song of that bird that was raised with just a female to that of its father or its tutor that you presented it with, and you can actually measure how similar it is, and you're pretty confident that there's no influence because it was raised with another female that is not singing. So I don't know if that clarifies a bit. There, there, there is some more complications to it. So there's a recent study that showed that female birds, just by flipping their wing, can actually direct song behavior. So there's this whole social aspect of song learning, which is very similar to humans as well. That it's a social learned aspect, and that, that's one parallel that I would argue zebra finches are really great at. Some birds, like white-crowned sparrows, you can put them by themselves as a baby in a soundproof box, you put in a tape recorder, you just press play, and they'll learn to repeat, uh, repeat that song. If you do that with a zebra finch, it'll be as if the bird has never heard a song in its life. It won't sound anything like a zebra finch song. So it won't learn unless it has a somewhat social model. And so that's why we think there's these really strong parallels with language learning, which is very socially reliant. Children, I taught children how to read for 30 years, so it's very much a social cycle when it was three years old. Yeah. Very important. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys, for, the, for these questions. They're really interesting. Uh, it looked like in a lot of aspects, in a lot of, of uh, the topics that we're talking about, it, it, we stumbled on this unknown about what the brain of these animals can actually do, right? So we, we were talking about the Alex and the parrot and, the, and these, these apes, and it looks like we, we maybe underestimated their brain power to, to do some of these things. So it looks like we need to keep studying brains in order to get some of these questions, right? So I'd like to move on a little bit from this esoteric topic of what language is and all the, the this heated debate to let's talk about the brain a little bit. I want, I want to know what's going on in our brains when we, when, we, when we produce language. But just before we move on, if you're thinking about getting a drink and you haven't yet, please do. Because if the tap room likes that we do this here, they will, they will welcome us more time. So please buy your drink. Awesome. <laughs> so I want to show a video. Okay, I, I hope I hope it's it's uh, it's we, we can see it well. But I really like um, this video because it, it shows us what our brains do to our language. And I'd like Maggie to comment on it a little bit. Oh boy. Um, no, we can do it after, but hopefully um, people, so I'll, I'll play this video, and I want you guys to pay attention, if you can, to this person's mouth, okay? So it's gonna be a face, and he's gonna be producing sounds, and pay attention to their mouths. And I'm gonna ask you what sound you heard, okay? Ba 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 What was the sound? Ba Will be, yeah, ba? Okay, great. Alright, so next one. Ba 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 I I don't know. Uh, if you could see very well their, pro their projection there, but what was the sound this time? A V? A V? Okay, I heard D there. Okay, okay, cool. Let's uh, listen to the third time. Um, the th oh, my bad. Technology. Third one. Ba 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 ba. Ba 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 ba. What about this time? That was a V, identical sound. Ba ba, ba, ba two sounds. All right, what happened there, Maggie? So I think that this is usually a cool illusion, but it's even cooler here with this slightly messed up projection because some of you can see the face and some of you can't. I feel like you're having a, either you're having a difficult time seeing the face, you've seen this before, or you have really good auditory perception. 
closing my eyes. You're closing your eyes. Okay. So the things that you see about the mouth, the articulatory, you know, structure of language matter. So the entire time that guy was saying ba. It is the video that is tricking you into you're supposed to hear first time is ba, second time is da with a d, and the third time is va with a v. And if you produce these sounds, ba, da, va, you can feel that it feels very different what you're doing with your mouth, and it also looks very different. Um, you have so overlearned what it looks like for someone to produce a D, a B, or a V sound, that when you see that, your brain says, nope, that was not a ba, I know that was a da. And I don't care what we heard, I saw that mouth, that was a da. So that, that's basically what, if those of you that it worked for, that's what you experienced. Um, and this importance of, this is called audiovisual speech. It's when you can see it and you can hear it at the same time. And audiovisual speech is important in other areas as well as like cutesy um, illusions. So if you are able to see someone's mouth while they're speaking, you can understand them much better. I'm sure you've experienced this. But this actually matters for your brain as well. Um, so there is an ERP component, so this is like a brain wave that we can measure on the scalp. And every time you hear an auditory onset, which is like a loud noise, um, your brain produces this component. It's called the N1 because it's negative and it happens at 100 milliseconds. It's a very creative field of study. So the N1 <laughs> is a response to auditory onsets. These happen all the time in speech. Not always at the beginning of the word, just a little bit of louder burst of sound will give you an N1. So if you are seeing someone's mouth while they're speaking, you will actually have a larger N1 to their auditory onsets, their loud noises, than if you cannot see their mouth. So this not only matters perceptually in this example, but it's, it's literally changing what your brain is doing in a way that we can easily measure just on the scalp. So it looks like our brain is doing fancy stuff. Fancy so, so um, can we assume that our brain has like specialized areas for language? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is a complicated debate. So in the beginning of sort of language and brain research, we had this idea that there were two areas of the brain that were really, really important for language. We have Broca's area and we have Wernicke's area. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of these. They're left lateralized. Broca's area was thought to be really, really important for producing language. Um, people who have lesions or damage to Broca's area have a hard time producing fluent speech. Um, and then Wernicke's area was really important for understanding the meaning of language and also producing language that makes sense. So if you have damage to your Wernicke's area, you can produce language still, but it doesn't make any sense. You keep talking and talking and talking, and no one actually knows what you're saying. Um, so these two brain injuries sort of spawned this idea that Broca's area and Wernicke's area are very special for language. They're like the language areas of the brain and they are the most important thing. Um, now we know that, it seems like this always happens with science, it's way more complicated than that. And language is really a whole brain experience. Um, in most people, language is generally left lateralized, which means you use specialized structures in your left hemisphere for language. But the right hemisphere is also very involved. Um, it's especially involved for low-level acoustics, so just like the sounds in general. Your two hemispheres are processing sound at different rates. So sounds that are faster are on the right, sounds that are slower are on the left, and this difference can be, um, it, it shows that we're not, it's not as simple as left lateralized and two areas. We really have a whole brain language processing system. And uh, Adrian, is, is, is it the same for reading and writing and, and, and spoken language in terms of the brain? So there's a, a, a specific brain region that has come to be called the visual word form area that seems to be involved in the recognition of printed words. Um, it seems to be involved in the recognition of words in alphabetic languages like English, but also in the recognition of characters in languages like Chinese. So um, it's actually, as you might expect, it lies actually at the in, right at the border between the visual areas of the brain at the back of the head and the language-specific areas of the brain in the left temporal lobe that Maggie was just referring to. 
And so it's sort of, it's anatomically where you would expect it to be, right at the border between those regions. So at the sort of bottom of the left occipital temporal junction. Um, and it's uh, it, exactly what the visual word form area is doing is a topic of great debate. Um, whether it's really somehow been recruited or is, is, is recognizing only letters and words or whether it's a, 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 an area that can be um, that actually is involved in a certain kind of visual perception of complex forms and just happens to be recruited by reading because that's what we do as modern humans. This is a, an area of debate, but there definitely does exist this very this area that if you go in an MRI and you you're, you do a reading task um, will light up differentially during that task. Cool, cool. And uh, do we see something similar in animals then, like that learn? Their vocalization? Yes. Cool. Yeah. So, um, getting back to Maggie's, uh, what she was mentioning, sort of the two sort of uh, dominant brain regions involved in vocal communication or language processing and production, we know, at least in songbirds, that there's similarities as well. Same with hummingbirds and parrots. Um, I don't know too much about in other vocal learning species, but in birds, at least, um, again, I mentioned there's these highly conserved auditory pathways, and in birds they seem to have a similar Wernicke's area, which is thought to be really important for speech processing. Um, it's called NCM, the cotomedial nidopalium, and it's very similar to auditory cortex, just like in you and I, and seems to light up, similar to what Adrian was saying in uh, humans when maybe they're reading, but in this case NCM lights up when birds are hearing another song. It doesn't activate when you play them tones or noises or music, but specifically the bird's uh, own species song is when this area lights up. Similar concept, but for production, there's this area called HVC, which uh, the acronym is actually the proper name for it. It used to be called the higher vocal center, but that's sort of fallen out of fashion. And we know that this area is similar to Broca's area, in that if you lesion this area, if you sort of shut it down, the birds can no longer produce any song behavior as well. Um, they, they make some like warbling noises, and one researcher back in the 70s noticed that they maybe sneezed a little bit more when they don't have this area, but that's about it. They're not able to sing. And then interestingly as well, getting to this idea of lateralization, um, even though these are bilateral structures, there seems to be a bigger impact for auditory memory in NCM in the left hemisphere. That seems to be the hub, or some, excuse me, some people think of it as. And similar for HVC, there seems to be a lateralized function, but both are required for vocal production. Really cool. So um, we're running a little low on time. Um, we're almost uh, at the end of our 7.30 block. Uh, 130, one hour and 30 minutes block. So um, we're going to, I'm going to ask um, if you guys would uh, be able to stick a little bit around to, to answer people's questions if you can, if that's okay. Um, so we're not going to have a Q&A question, a Q&A block right away because I want to ask a couple more questions to, to you guys before we adjourn. Okay, awesome. Um, so we learned a little bit about brain, what language is, seems to, like the answer to everything seems to be it's complicated. Huh, I don't know. <laughs> but um, I want to talk a little bit about the future and where we're heading, okay, with language. My, the most important question in this panel to me is, are emojis language? <laughs> I read somewhere that apparently 92% of everyone that has internet uses emoji to communicate. Can we consider it language? No. Maybe Adrian? Yes? No? Any input? <laughs> Do you use emojis? I have used emojis. <laughs> I admit I use them. I mean, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. So, I don't know emojis. <laughs> okay, it seems. I, Emojis are sort of the modern day version of body language, I would say, people thinking of that as language. 
And uh, there's this like, I guess, classic example where people, you know, a really obvious example of uh, very descriptive body language is maybe, you know, you do some posturing like this, it's somewhat universally understood. But uh, I heard an example that asked, um, but try conveying that it will snow on Tuesday using just your eyebrows. And the same could be said of emojis as well. You can surely get across really basic concepts through just direct images, but it no longer is what language is, which I would argue is this sort of arbitrary symbolic form. You know, dog doesn't actually represent what a dog is, but if you have an image of it, you, you have more information, but you can't get into more complex syntax than that. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could actually argue that emojis are, are a return to the origins of language, right? Yeah. So, so we, we had, what is that? No, 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 like, it's, it's, it's okay, you're okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so, so some of the earliest evidence of human linguistic behavior or human, yeah, I guess you'd say human linguistic behavior are these hieroglyphics in which, the, in which there are representations that are direct visual representations of the things to which they refer and that's where we are now, right? Um, so we've come back. <laughs> Great. Don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> really cool. Um, so unfortunately, we're going to um, have to adjourn right now. But the last thing I want from you guys, okay, in a couple of words, um, is we want to know a little bit. Uh, I want to know. I don't know if you guys. Well, I hope so. I want to know a little bit more about your work. Um, just in a couple of words, what have you found and why is it important? Yeah? That's always a terrifying question. But, um, so, I am really excited about finishing up my work at UMass right now because I've, I've been studying child language development. I do experiments in the lab with children, trying to understand language processing in the real world. But I use an EEG system that is attached to a wall. Um, the kids have to wear a funny hat. I have to do the same experiment with the children every time in order to be able to compare a big group of kids. So I'm trying really hard to play inside those boundaries while still giving the children something that is like, like real life, as close as I can get it. And I think as lay people, you will hear what I'm doing and you'll be like, wow, why haven't we been doing this all along? It, I'm just having them listen to stories. They answer questions about the stories. This is something that's very different from what a lot of people do with children in the lab. And I'm finding that when you do something that's really natural and normal for children, the results are different. And I think that it's really important that we are doing experiments in the lab that are as relevant to real world people as possible. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess that's what I'm the most excited about right now. Awesome, cool. Okay, so um, what does this sentence mean? Uh, visiting relatives can be dangerous. <laughs> Anyone? What does it mean? Is that a verb or an adjective? Good. Good question, right? So that's the question. So that sentence is ambiguous. It could mean one of two different things. It could mean it's dangerous for ha to have relatives visit you, or it could mean it's dangerous to go visit relatives. Right? Um, so language is full of ambiguity, um, and one of the things I study, and that, that's an example of what's called a syntactic ambiguity. So there are two different grammatical analyses of that sentence. None of the individual words is ambiguous as to its meaning, but the grammatical analysis of the sentence is ambiguous. And one of the things I study is how we resolve those ambiguities, how we deal with those ambiguities in real time as we're listening or reading. Um, these ambiguities are actually everywhere. Um, we don't realize it, but they're all around us, and we have to resolve them all the time. So if I say, um, put the present in the box on the table in the kitchen, that sentence is actually about five ways ambiguous, right? The box can be on the table in the kitchen, the present can be put, right, you, you're starting, okay, so just play that back in your head, and you'll see it's about five ways ambiguous. You have to come up with an interpretation, and you have to apply the rules of grammar of your language to, as you're hearing that sentence or reading it, and most of my work involves reading, figure out uh, which analysis you're gonna go with. And so one of the main things that I study is how, we, how our brains automatically decide which analysis to go with and how we recover when we've initially adopted the wrong one. Um, okay. Uh, so, my research right now is not related to language at all. Um, I'm just studying how much voles will miss their partner when they're spent some time away from them. But my dissertation is much more related to the topic of tonight, which was 
um, studying again how hormones are involved in hearing and producing and learning bird song. And uh, one of the big takeaways is that estrogens uh, are really important in developing male songbirds for both hearing song as well as for learning song. And it depends on what hemisphere the estrogens are acting within as well. So this, we're turning to this idea of lateralization. So with that, um, I would like to call it a night. Um, please hang around to talk to our speakers if you have more questions. Uh, I'd like to thank the Tap Room again for letting us come here. Um, and thank you all for coming. This has been a lot of fun, at least for me. I hope you, have, I hope you enjoyed it. We do this every month. Uh, we love feedback, so please uh, tell us what you think. Uh, sign up to our mailing list, give us feedback, and Hope you enjoyed it. Have a good night. Thanks for coming. Get started. So take a seat. It's the Science Cafe brought to you by.